Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for the second Sunday of Easter. Easter is a week of Sundays. And uh, so this is the second week of Sundays, or the second of the week of Sundays. The first reading uh, is Acts 4, 32-35, a very strange little narrative portion. Just, Matt, you really, in your commentary, save it. Psalm 133. 1 John 1, 1 through 2, 2, and John 20, 19 through 31. Here we are in John. Well, before we move to John, uh, we might just want to mention uh, to the preachers out there that, wow, you have choices. You have so many choices going through these seven Sundays of Easter because we begin a a series, of course, through reading First John. Uh, so we we go through the se Easter season with uh, with all of Easter coming from the uh, First John. You could also do a series on Acts, which might be Matt's suggestion, or uh, you could stick with John, dip into Luke for just a brief little moment next week and go back to John. So a lot of choices. I think it's helpful for the, uh, the preacher to go look ahead and see what you want to do. But if you do choose to preach on uh, this always John text on the second Sunday of Easter, uh, familiarly known as the Doubting Thomas text, uh, what do we have to say? Well, first of all, we will say that it's not about doubt at all. Uh, there is no doubt here. It is, uh, Jesus says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And what we have here are, of course, two, the resurrection appearances, two and three out of four in John. Uh, and I point that out because uh, it really, it, it, I think it really resonates with the kind of conversations that we've been having the last couple of weeks about witness. Because um, Jesus appears to the disciples in the locked room, uh, gives them the Holy Spirit. This is the Pentecost text in year A, I believe. I don't know. Don't don't quote me on that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Thomas was not there. And a week later, Jesus appears to Thomas. And so uh, one of the unique features of the resurrection appearances in John is this is the way in which Jesus offers himself uh, that this 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 offering of Jesus self to each to each to 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 individuals and, and whatever it is they might need. Uh, and the way in which that recognition uh, happens uh, for each of the each of these resurrection appearances really focus on that kind of individuality. And so for Mary, it's hearing her name being called. And for Thomas, it's the fact that Jesus offers his entire self. He offers his, his entire wounded body uh, for, for Thomas to experience that brings Thomas to faith. And sometimes we say, well, Thomas needed to touch. Well, not really sure because we're, we're not told that he actually touches Jesus' body. Um, and, and how is it that the that that moment of recognition or realization is this, uh, is the way in which uh, Jesus' abundant grace, you know, the abundant grace of Jesus meets Thomas where he is, where he's at. And, uh, and I think that that's, uh, it's not about doubt and skepticism, uh, but it's that, it's that individual encounter where the relationship is restored uh, that, uh, that that Thomas has been promised uh, that he then then realizes or experiences and confesses my Lord and my God. In the midst of the, I really appreciate that Caroline, and in the midst of the cancel culture that we are in, what stood out for me uh, as I read verse 26 in the context of Thomas not being there the first time, uh, he just wasn't with them for whatever reason, but they give testimony 
to the fact that they have seen Jesus. And when they're gathered together again, Thomas is with them. They didn't kick Thomas out for not being with them when they first encountered Jesus. And Thomas didn't give up on their testimony because they had an experience that he had not had. So that when they gathered again, they let Thomas be there and Thomas chose to come. And I, I think that that's important for us to remember that there are some folks that aren't going to um, express their experience with Jesus in the same way that we do. They're not going to express how they've experienced God in the same way that we do, but they still want to have an encounter, a disruption in their life that brings hope. And it's an extension of hospitality that the disciples let him be there and that he chose to keep hanging out with them even though they had an experience he had not had. And at that point, he didn't even know if he would. This is such a gross scene in so many ways, uh, but it's beautiful too. The, the whole notion of, of Jesus offering his wounded self like this. I, I, I like everything that's been said so far about this notion of an encounter and the need to respect uh, Thomas's own individuality and his own way of coming to, to belief. The, I, I, about a year ago, or exactly a year ago, I did a, a, a class, a Sunday morning lecture on, on this scene, but looking at a lot of depictions in art which I know very little about, but came across a whole bunch of paintings. It's very interesting to see ways in which this gets depicted. Sometimes the other disciples all like looking, you know, watching Thomas, you know, reach out his hand. Sometimes he's inside Jesus' body. Sometimes he's not. But there are also some, some artists who have depicted this as an individual scene or where they're definitely shrouded or even where Jesus like has a cloak up so that nobody else can see. And, the, and all the focus is brought to just these two individuals. Um, which has really has kind of transformed my way of viewing this passage and really understanding the intimacy that's going on here, the intimacy offered and the intimacy experienced. Uh, and again, whether touching or not doesn't matter, but the, the way in which we set this up, is this for all of us to watch from a distance as, as readers and, and be amazed by or kind of ogle at, or, I mean, there's something about this that makes me not want to read it. You know what I mean? Because it feels like I'm looking through somebody's window. Not that I have a lot of experience with that. Let me just qualify that. Uh, do you know what I mean? It's almost a little bit too voyeuristic because it is so intensely personal. I, uh, I've talked to people before. I know somebody who doesn't like to watch other people worship do you know I mean? because he feels like it's an invasion of privacy in so many ways. But there's something about that. Um, I don't really know what I'm, I don't know where to go with this, but just to highlight well, that there's something yeah it looks kind of gross on the on the outside I've come to discover is really beautiful and yet still strange well I think I I think one of the aspects that you're getting at too Matt is yeah it is deeply intimate and deeply personal and it's you know it's one of the things that I talked about earlier about how Jesus is meeting uh each of these disciples right where they are uh, and and which I think in John is a reaffirmation of that relationship. That's really what is salvation in John. It's a relationship with God and with Jesus. This intimate, deep, personal, abiding relationship. And and so the 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 resurrection appearances are less about uh, are I, well. I don't know if I want to say less about. They are every bit as much about a restoration or a, a, the re-promise of that relationship as they are about Jesus being raised from the dead. And, and so uh, one of the remarkable things too here uh, that I think uh, uh, underscores what you're saying is that both now with Mary and with Thomas in their confessions or in their, their testimonies, is not just a is not only a recognition of who of Jesus, but it's also a recognition of their own identities. And so, with Mary, she says, "I have seen the Lord." Uh, she doesn't see she she says, "I have seen the Lord," and she, but she but she calls him Rabuni, 
uh, uh, teacher. And in that, she doesn't say, you know, she doesn't say, oh, hey, Jesus, or whatever. She says, Rabuni, recognizing that she is a disciple. Uh, this is my teacher. This is my, this is my teacher. And for, for Thomas, it's a similar, this is my Lord whom I have been following. I am a disciple, but also my God, which is the, which is the huge claim in this gospel. So there it's this, and we'll get the same thing in John 21, not this year, but uh, where Jesus appears to Peter and it's a, it's a, it's a discipleship narrative again um it's that whole scene in john 21 is a is a hearkening back to discipleship so these moments of recognition are not only you know jesus but also a recognition of self uh of recognition of one's own identity or a reaffirmation of one's identity that is really deeply personal that we get to that we get to look in on and listen to and then also imagine ourselves uh, in that same kind of place. The um, one part that's not really central to the narrative, but is central to, I think, the theology of the New Testament that I just want to highlight here is the fact that the risen Christ still bears the marks of crucifixion in the appearances. Uh, I think this is so important uh, in part because of the theology of the cross that the resurrection does not erase the crucifixion. Um, he, it's the crucified one who is resurrected, um, which I think means among other things that crucifixion was not simply a one-time atonement equation, but it actually then crucifixion uh, and the cross, the word of the cross, the message about the cross, of the cross, as Paul says, is, the pattern for God's uh, presence in the world, that God will show up in suffering and has promised to do so. God has promised to show up in your suffering. So I, I realize that that pulls it away from the narrative, but uh, you can put that in your back pocket. Uh, it's probably already there for other, uh, to, to connect other things. We should move to Acts. Matt, if you were going to have a trajectory over the next few, few weeks and think about, okay, how would you build a sermon series on Acts? Uh, how would you set, how would you help somebody set that up? Uh, I wrote a column for a working preacher three years ago that talked about preaching Acts during year B. The problem is I wrote that three years ago and I don't remember exactly what I said in it. So, hey, okay. Um, we can say- edit that part out if you want. No, I'm going to, I, well, <laughs> just kidding. Keep going. I, I'll say, read my article, but also recognize that like, uh, like any good biblical interpreter, I'm free to change my mind over time, uh, as are all of you and as are our listeners. So, uh, you know, this year it's, um, it's a variety of, of, of people, of, of, of figures who, We'll get up and and preach. So we get a, we get after this scene. We're also going to see. Um, well, I, I mentioned it in the in the in the in the commentary. Some bold proclamation in some places. Some utterly astounding conversions. We're going to see conflict. We're going to see a variety of ways in which the good news is preached or embodied in different settings. Some more receptive than others, but all of them are attempts to, I think, live out that, that Acts 1-8 theme, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it will be a reminder, I think, that there are various ways in which the church bears witness together, which is why I don't mind, uh, in this case, that, that we begin with Acts 4, 32 through 35, and next we're going to jump back to Acts 3. We get to that, we're going to go back to earlier in Acts 4, we're out of se- narrative sequence. But this is a nice reminder that before you see the heroics of Peter or of Philip, to remember that there's always a community and that salvation in, in, as Acts sees it is not turn to Jesus and become one of these famous people. It's turn to Jesus and find a new belonging or a new home in this community, a community that enables some people to do amazing things in public, but also is taking care of its own in, in more private settings and is uh, forming this new alternate society. And people will be brought into that. The one exception will be three weeks from now, uh, the Ethiopian court official 
who goes back home. We don't know if he has a community of believers to join. We, we hope he will. But for the most part, everybody else in Acts is connected to community uh, around their hearing of the good news and their receiving of it. And this shows us a bit about why community is so important for this, uh, for this narrative. And if I draw uh, from that, Matt, is um, so often when we talk about belonging and having community, we think of in our, uh, or maybe I should say this personally, in my singleness and aloneness, it's like, it's really great for me to know that I belong somewhere, that I have a community, a tribe. Um, but the reality um, for me that I read in this is that because of that belonging, these are the actions that happen. So it doesn't stop as whew, I'm in, you know, I, I get to wear the cap. I get, you know, I get, I get a t-shirt, I get a button. It is what happens because of this new community in the midst of our cultural context. And it does something that the culture doesn't do. It attends to the least. It pays attention to the needy. It makes sure that all have the abundance of life, which is not like a pie in the sky when you die, but you've heard me say it before, it's tomatoes on our table. You know, it's ham where I am. It's chicken in my kitchen. It's right now, right here. There are no hungry and no thirsty anymore. And that is the good news of this new community that is formed. And you know what? I wanna to belong to that group. You laughed. I, I can tell that's a line. I've never heard you say that before, I don't think, but that's a line you've cultivated. You own that one. Ham where I am, kitchen. United Methodist Bishop by Catholic. On my table. Sounds like it sounds like Dr. Seuss. That is great. No, I'm gonna I might I might use that. I will footnote you, but I will uh, it is yours. Own. I stole it, I assure you. I love it. Oh, speaking of community, I mean uh, Psalm 133 is a uh, a perfect little poem about community um but it is um it you know its meaning is debated and it's um so i'll just let me just give a, my little shtick on it and first of all it's just this beautiful delight short poem but it starts out by saying how very good and pleasant it is when kindred literally brothers live together in unity um, and then it has images from both the northern and southern kingdom mm -hmm. the northern kingdom you've got um the dew of Hermon, this mountain in the north and then um zion in the south um and it calls to mind that most often um most often in the history that the the kindred of is uh, the kindred of Israel were not at uh, good and pleasant relationships. They were not in unity. I think it's maybe maybe your church or your church tradition is not in unity. And so this this does talk about God's blessings overcoming the lack of human unity, the lack of community, or the divisions within that community. You were talking about joy and that. God's blessings of life forevermore, which flow from all of God's activities on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, in Old and New Testament, it overcomes, um, it overcomes our human disunity. So it's, kind of, it's that lovely image to me uh, of realizing our divisions are not permanent. Is this the shortest Psalm? Nope, 117. 117? But this is short. This is yeah. up there or okay. down there. Out down there, it. one of those. I think Got the it. psalmist, after doing this metaphor about like oil rolling down Aaron's beard onto his robe, disfigured. What else I can I that, say? I think I, I think I just nailed it. I don't need any more metaphors. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can end. When we, I had just gotten married to my wife, Amy, and uh, my psalms teacher. Jim Limberg invited me over his house and they always would read a psalm uh, after dinner or before dinner, I can't remember. And so this was the one up for that night and he read it and my wife's face was like, what? 
beard running down on his head over it on his beard on the beard of Aaron running down over his collar. What? She, she was quite uh, traumatized actually by the image. That's why you do your own laundry. I do do my own laundry. You're a priest with all that oil. Yeah. So first John, this is not a text that gets a lot of preaching attention because it falls in Easter and has got other exciting texts vying for its attention. But it's a book that a lot of people really love. It's a very popular book in a lot of Bible study circles and personal devotional uh, settings because of some of its, its main themes around love. What does a preacher need to know about this if they want to tackle 1 John this Easter? Well, uh, I might have um, I might have Ben put up a, a res I don't know if we well uh, maybe we can get a link but I, I wrote on this uh, for the preacher's Bible handbook on first second and third John and you're absolutely right uh, Matt there's so much familiar language in this there's something that really that that really resonates uh, with people um, and particularly, uh, you know, some of the language of verse eight, right? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things, one of the homiletical techniques I think that's, in, that's uh, important is this when, this, when this kind of language shows up uh, that we're used to saying liturgically to locate it then back into its scriptural context, you know, the liturgists most, for the most part, don't make stuff up. Uh, it's, they're borrowing from scripture. And so um, how does that, how does this then sound uh, located back into uh, uh, this particular, uh, this particular book? And it, uh, and it, it, it's a, it's a book, you know, it's a, it's a letter that's also really Again, going back to a lot of what we've been saying about testimony, it's a book that uh, there's there's clearly uh, this is where we get the term antichrist. There's clearly uh, 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 what uh, what do I want to say? Uh, competition out there <laughs> for uh, what what is it that what is it that we're going to say about uh, who Jesus is? And I think that's maybe also a homiletical cue, if you will, is that it's an invitation into what, what is it that you will say about who Jesus is? Uh, and so it not, not just about the content of the book, but a sort of frame or sort of a uh, ethos of preaching that invites people to say, well, what, what, what will I say about what I believe and who I think, uh, who I think Jesus is? So that just, that's one, one possibility, one couple of reflections there. And uh, if we start at uh, verse one, um, that we are bearing te testimony to what has been witnessed to us, uh, so that there is a continuity of this uh, expression of who Christ is, uh, what God's disruption in the world looks like uh, from the beginning. Um, when God shows up, um, there is a, a recognition that we've missed the mark, that we're less than what it would be to truly reflect the glory of God, that um, uh, if we, if we uh, turn into uh, what it means to walk in the light, um, that we are like those who sometimes stumble as we walk in the light. Um, let's be honest about where we are in the journey and recognize that the moment that we're in has continuity both in our affirmation of who God is in Christ, but also in our confession of who we are at this moment in our journey. It's it's not new to us. There's nothing new under the sun. I, I think that's a different verse, but um, it's not new to us. But it is con uh, con it is uh, uh, in continuity with what has been testified to from the beginning. And it builds fellowship. In, in this passage, the, the movement in those opening verses of we've borne witness to this, now we declare. So that I think there's two appearances of we declare to you so that we might have fellowship with you, or you might have fellowship with us. Um, 
and like like uh, you pointed out, Caroline, there's competition out there. There's there's dangerous beliefs or people who have left the fellowship, so there's worry about that. But that's that's the hard part of preaching and thinking about fellowship. How do you bear witness authentically, openly? How does that move to declaration? How does that move to openness and embrace? while recognize that we're also saying no to some things and to some teachings and to some people and to some theologies uh, and to find a way to balance that so that we're not, so that we say all are welcome here. We're really, are we really telling the truth or what does that mean, right? And so what is, what is the nature of this witness? How does it lead to openness uh, to the broader world? How does it lead to knowing ourselves really well and appreciating others who might believe differently, but also being honest about where those boundary markers lie, where those fences uh, are, uh, because otherwise there's something disingenuous um, about some of our, our, our language around fellowship. But this is where witness should lead. It should lead not to screaming on the street corner or fighting, it should lead toward real deep conversations about what is authentic fellowship and how does that tie in um, how does that tie in here as well to confession and forgiveness, which is also one of these rhythms? I was going to say so that your joy might be complete. Oh, <laughs> there you go. 